When you even begin to talk about the asymmetry, you have to sort of say that there are two states that you're comparing. You're comparing non-existence to existence. And each one of these states have certain attributes or certain lack of attributes, certain um, things that actually are possible and certain things that aren't possible. Um, for example, when you don't exist, you can't suffer. When you don't exist, you can't invoke agency. When you do exist, you can suffer. But when you do exist, you can invoke agency. So <clears throat> we are talking about two separate things and two separate things that, you know, do actually, in some sense, bear some sort of comparison to each other. Um, but what does non-existence mean and what does existence mean? What does it mean to actually exist and what does it mean to actually not exist? It looks to me as though <clears throat> existence itself implies that something exists, therefore something, whatever you want to call it, uh, seems to be an individual identity, something that is capable of having experiences, something that is capable of feeling pleasure and suffering. Whereas if you're, and invoking agency, I guess, even if in an erroneous way. <clears throat> Whereas if you, if you don't exist, then you cannot invoke agency and you cannot suffer and you cannot feel pleasure. Two separate things. What does it mean to exist? What is he, what is Benatar referring to by existence itself? Is he, is he talking about an I? I think that maybe he doesn't want to talk about an I, but I think an I is implicit in what he's saying, because again, there has to be something on the receiving end of an experience, which is what pleasure and suffering are, which means that there has to be something along the lines of an identity, an I, or at least an it, something that is on the receiving end of experience. Something that is sort of the object to the subject. Um, pleasure and suffering are visited upon something that exists in an existent state, i.e. after birth. And there is something that is absent. Absent in terms of what? In terms of the non-existence of said identity, I, uh, object, on the receiving end of experience. When you don't exist, there's nothing to, to experience anything. When you do exist, there is something to experience everything. That looks to me as though he's sort of, without meaning to, positing the existence of an I or of an identity. Um, <clears throat> now, you look at that and you sort of say, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean for there to be something on the receiving end of pleasure and suffering? They can say, well, the, the I apparently exists. It's an illusion, though. Okay, an illusion visited upon what? <laughs> um, it, it's sort of interesting. Like, when, when you try and explain the I as an illusion, you end up just sort of in something resembling infinite regression, or at least um, a circular argument. It's often even framed in terms of a circular argument with the two mirrors facing each other. That is just a circular argument or infinite regression or a tautology or whatever you want to call it. Um, in the end, though, you, you're left with the seeming paradox of that which does not exist being convinced that it does exist. Now, what do you do with paradoxes like that? Well, you could just go back to the three um, fundamental rules or laws of classical logic and say that that is wrong. There has to be an I, right? Um, because he's, if something is tricked into thinking that it exists, it has to pre-exist in order to be tricked into th thinking anything. Um, but again, no, there is no I. Unless, of course, Benatar is sort of saying that there is an I on a certain level. Now, that's the interesting part. He talks about people, people do things for selfish reasons. Now, that's motive, right? Now, that's sort of, now motive does seem to be desire. You want something. Now, desire, again, requires an eye. Or something resembling an eye. Something that sort of goes out into the causal chain. Something that is being put out onto the causal chain that doesn't appear inherently. Desire. That's why, again, this sort of line that recurs in the Gita, even though in just implicitly, maybe it never actually even got said in the Gita, where Krishna says to Arjuna, all is clouded by desire. Now, what does he mean by that? Clouded. You can't 
see things clearly because of desire, because of your own preconceptions that are placed on reality, your prolepsis, what you expect to see, what you want to see, what you fear you will see. You, in other words, something is projecting desire onto the causal chain. Something. I'm not saying that there is an I here, but again, I'm trying to sort of get to the essence of what the asymmetry really means. Um, it seems almost inevitable that there, there is an I in the asymmetry, because something has to be on the receiving end of the experiences that Benatar alludes to for there to be any comparison in the asymmetry at all. <clears throat> what do you do about that? What do you do about the um, seeming paradox there, or seeming contradiction there, between a purely deterministic universe, which is implied by um, the, the, the implication that we are nothing but passive sort of objects in the causal chain, everything just happens to us, and the seeming um, desires that get projected onto that causal chain. Where do the desires come from? Where do the aversions and the desires come from? Where even does indifference come from? What is it that is indifferent? <laughs> you know, like a rock is not indifferent. A rock just is. It, it doesn't have desires. It doesn't have aversions. It, it just is. It's not even indifferent. Uh, indifference implies the possibility of being non-indifferent, and I don't think a rock has the capacity to be non-indifferent. I seem to have the capacity to be non-indifferent. Benatar certainly implies that humans have the capacity to be non-indifferent when he talks about obligations to avoid suffering. Is he just talking uh, contradictorily here? Is he speaking in, in contradictions? I said a few videos ago that that may be belief. That may be doublethink. That may be something that he has convinced himself of purely irrationally. Lying, maybe? How do I know? I don't know. I can't know. Consciousness doesn't work like that. I'll never be able to analyze fully what's going on in Benatar's mind. So that really doesn't matter why he's doing it. But I would say that you, you have to, to make sort of two determinations here. Is he just spinning you a yarn? Is he trying to just get you to believe something irrationally? Um, or is are both of these seeming contradictions, seeming contradictions, um, actually both possible but on different levels, on in different ladders of the mind? Because he thoroughly deals with, or hints at, or alludes to, the concept of the ego. Now, what is the ego? It's, you know, a lot of people use ego colloquially just as, well, you're, it's just evidence of our own selfishness. Whose own selfishness? Or what is it that's being selfish? It looks like there's an I there. How, how do you have selfishness if there's no self? Well, it's the illusion of self. The illusion of self visited upon what? <laughs> you know? Again, if something is... If something is on the receiving end of illusions, then it apparently the, there is something there to be fooled, to make errors. The other you know, problem there is how do you have any errors in, in a purely deterministic universe? Because uh, you know, there's neither error nor truth in a deterministic universe. There, there's no right and wrong there. It's just cause, causal chain going back to the beginning of time and stretching ahead to the end of time. Nothing is right or wrong in any of that. It's just raw mechanics. So there's no error there. But it, if, it, if, if the I doesn't exist, but the I looks like it exists, or the ego even, and it's an illusion, then something is making an error. <laughs> you know, you have to sort of try and square these things together. And again, I'm not trying to box him in with things like the law of non-contradiction that I don't necessarily fully subscribe to different levels of reality, different levels of abstraction, different levels of analysis. If you look at um, certain monistic conceptions of reality, the I exists and the I does not exist. There is an identity and there is not an identity. There is an ego, but it is somehow implied that it is desirable to transcend the ego. What is the ego? The ego is the illusion of I-ness, or perhaps the 
illusion of dualistic I-ness. The idea that there's all these little individual me's out there, as opposed to just one big it, or us, or, you know, that which perceives, that which is conscious. That's one way of looking at the apparent contradiction between the I and, or the apparent I and the desire to transcend it. Because if you, if you want to transcend your ego, what is it that wants to transcend the ego? <laughs> um, the illusion, or sorry, the, the illustration that's often made, that's often used in Eastern uh, metaphors to talk about that seeming paradox between monism and, uh, or the, the sort of consciousness as a monad or panpsychism or whatever you want to call it, is the waves on the ocean. The individual waves exist, I guess, in a certain sense, and if they were if they were capable of looking at each other, they would see different waves. You know, one wave would look around and see a gazillion different other waves. But in another sense, they're all the same thing. They're all the ocean, right? They're all water. You know, just below the surface is this commonality that they are actually linked together. They are all the same thing. Any sort of idea that each wave is somehow different from the other is both true and not true, because we can say that there's a wave, a wave hitting the shore, but it's just part of the larger ocean, right? Hard science tells us this, that, you know, uh, matter, energy, and empty space, that's all it is. So, in a certain sense, again, I mentioned Syadvada, the theory of maybe, the Jain theory of maybe, where you sort of look at things from as many different perspectives as possible, especially a positive statement, where you say, in some ways the I exists, in some ways it doesn't exist. In some ways the ego exists, in some ways it doesn't exist. In some ways... We do live in a deterministic universe in some ways that in some ways we don't. In some ways we do and we don't. And in some ways it seems to be so clouded by everything that we can't tell the difference. And it might be indescribable. <clears throat> so when you start looking at these paradoxes that seem to be inherent in what Benatar is saying, um, rather than just sort of saying it's logically incoherent and it doesn't work, maybe what he's saying is actually correct, but in different levels of, ab of abstraction, on different rungs on the ladder of the mind, that he's sort of mixing together. That strikes me as perhaps the real error that he's making, um, which may not really be an error. It's not so much that he's seeing things that aren't there, but he's, mi he's mixing different levels of perception together in his asymmetry and he's mixing in assumptions he's mixing assumptions he's implying certain things that don't seem to be actually stated in his asymmetry <clears throat> pleasure and suffering exist if you exist if what exists something exists and that implies an I that implies an I that doesn't exist but the I actually, the existence of an I kind of militates against the idea of pleasure and suffering being all that there is, because the I wants all kinds of other things. The I is proud. The I has ego. The I has uh, uh, will, the will to power, the will to win arguments, the win, will to dominate, the will not to be dominated, which have nothing to do with pleasure or suffering. Um, although being dominated, even though you're not being hurt, you're not, you're not being harmed, is something we don't want. So I suppose you could say that the will actually is the will to not, uh, to have one's power thwarted. The will not to have one's power th thwarted. So a will seems to exist there. What is the will? How do you actually square that with the idea that suffering and pleasure are all that there are of value in this existence? How does Benatar deal with that? How does he deal with the apparent lack of of mention of the will in what he is saying when the will actually does seem to be apparent in everything that humans do. There are many different, many things that he says in his book, Better Never to Have Been, that seem on first glance to be unarguable. You start to deconstruct these things. You start to deconstruct the assumptions implicit in everything. And it's not that everything starts to fall apart. But everything seems to, the, the, the pieces of the puzzle don't seem to fit together as neatly anymore. And the puzzle becomes a lot more complicated and a lot more, um, a lot, a lot bigger than he phrases it in a simple asymmetry. On the surface of it, the asymmetry isn't so much wrong as it's incomplete. It doesn't actually give us a full view 
a feel a full picture of reality, even if we take it at face value. I'll end with a simple question. What are the assumptions inherent in the asymmetry? What are the assumptions inherent in ideas like pleasure and suffering and non-existence and existence? What are the assumptions that he just takes for granted and doesn't question? I don't really have, I haven't posited any answers here to any of this, but what I've said, what, I, what I'm trying to point out is that his little neat little four boxes is a very incomplete picture of the entire phenomenon of existence and non-existence. Even if we accept his own terminology and his own goalposts, his, the, the asymmetry that he illustrates, even if taken at face value, ends up being incomplete. This is kind of a really kind of cryptic sort of video, and I'm known for cryptic videos, but I think that it, I think that I've, I've made the point that there's so much unsaid in what, and just implied in everything that Benatar does, um, that I think that you, you don't even have to so much refute what he says, is you can transcend it. Uh, you can sort of say, in a very limited context, what he's saying is right. Very limited. But there's almost an infinite number of other possible contexts.